Okay, great. So we may start to jump into it. So before I begin, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are streaming from today. For me, it is the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us today. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you. Um, so my name is Natalia and I am a member of the Fostering Connections team. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, this is a live session, very interactive, submit all your questions, very happy to make it catered for your needs and whatever you're curious about. But what I will be doing is going over, you know, what is foster care? What role does foster connections play? What's the process to become a carer? And what are some of the myths and frequently asked questions that come up often when people are curious about foster care? Um, so before we begin and dive into all the information, I just want to flag that there's a few things happening in May that we want to share with the community. So this Sunday, Fostering Connections is going to be marching at Midsummer um, Pride Parade um, in St. Kilda. So if you are in, local in the area or if you want an opportunity to pop in, I think a lot of the um, community will be there. So we um, are happy to say hello and share some support for the community. Um, May is also Families Week. So Families Week is currently um, from the 15th to the 21st. Um, and this year, the theme is Stronger Families, Stronger Communities. Um, so it is an opportunity to celebrate the wonderfully diverse families that are in Australia and that families come in all shapes and sizes. Um, and foster families are a part of that. Um, so with that, we just want to highlight the beautiful work that foster carers do um, in supporting children, reunifying with their family and feeling safe in their homes. Um, so since we don't have any questions just yet, um, I'll explain Fostering Connections. So we are Victoria's statewide foster care recruitment campaign. Um, we provide support and education for the community to understand foster care. Um, we support prospective foster carers when they're making the decision to jump in, whether that's submitting the inquiry via our website, which is fosteringconnections.com.au, or giving um, our inquiry line a call. You'll most likely have a chat with myself or someone else from my team. Phone number here is right behind me, so it's 1-800-013-088. Um, and we um, do operate 24-7, but um, Monday to Friday, you'll be able to have a chat with a specialist. Um, and that is where you can get all those nitty gritty questions answered or anything that's specific for your um, circumstance. Um, about myself, so I have been working in out of home care for about eight years. Um, and I've been working directly with children and young people, um, with birth families, with foster carers, um, working in recruitment and assessment of care. So um, I, I really do love working with people to support them in finding out if foster care is the right thing for them and helping them understand it a little bit more. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to clarify for that that for you guys today. So in terms of foster care, it is the temporary care of children and young people by members of the community who have been trained and accredited to become foster carers. So you as a foster care are looking after children who have um, likely been removed from home due to safety concerns. Often um, child protection might be involved, though not every single time that is the case. Um, and the goal is to return those children to care, um, to their family's care as soon as it's safely possible to do so. So foster carers play a really key role in supporting that return to family. Um, and then in the instances that children are not able to return to family, um, foster carers provide that permanency and that long-term safety for them as well. So within Victoria at the moment, we have about 11,000 children that are in out-of-home care and over 1,500 of those, and these numbers are from um, uh, last year, are in foster care. Um, so foster care is very flexible, um, which is one of the things that people are uh, always surprised to learn. Um, there's very many different types of care and they allow you to cater fostering to be um, accessible to what your household needs are. So if, um, if you want to provide shorter placements or something more long term, um, if you have children in the home, it is really flexible and it will evolve with you as that journey progresses for you. So it can change to what your needs are and to ensure that you provide the best care for the children that come into placement with you. Um, the children that come into foster care are often children that have um, experienced challenges and some difficulties, um, but they're just like other children and foster carers do approach their fostering with, um, with support from the agency, with um, an open heart to uh, help that child feel really safe and secure in the home and comfortable sharing their traditions, their culture, um, building those attachments. So it is a really uh, diverse 
role that you take on as a carer and you get to walk alongside that journey for a child that is likely going through something that's very uncertain, um, something that is a bit scary um, when you don't know where you're going to live or what decisions are going to happen. Um, and so it, it really is a privilege as a carer to walk alongside a child um, and be that support for them and for their family as that is happening, as well as with all the wraparound supports that you get from the agency. So agencies will look specifically at what your household needs are to ensure that the child that's placed with you is the best match for your household as well, because that way that'll be um, as successful as it can be, um, which is what we want. We want positive experiences for children in care. So if you um, are curious, you can find a lot more information on our website. Um, I also think we have some blogs coming up soon about Families Week. Um, we had a beautiful blog posted last weekend from a foster care who shared that experience. So I think that might be um, that might be in the chat later for you guys to have that link. Um, but it is some some great information there for you to see if you want to have a read later um, or before you give us a call. Um, essentially, who can become a foster care? So as I mentioned before, types of care are very flexible and people who become, become foster carers come from all walks of life. So it's very diverse and we want um, individuals who are committed, who are excited and passionate about supporting children and um, who you know, want to be able to provide that support. So from all backgrounds and all stages of life, um, you can be single, you can be in a relationship, you can be a same-sex couple, um, you can have diverse gender identities. Like we encourage everyone who thinks they can support that to explore that further to see if it is the right fit for you. Um, connecting children to culture, um, if you can provide, you know, support of helping a child feel safe culturally in your home, um, that, that's a huge aspect of it too, sharing your traditions, learning the child's um, traditions, um, so, so it, is, uh, it is very diverse and, and we do encourage um, people from all ages and stages to consider making this jump. Um, the process to become a foster care. So essentially, if you come through us um, and with most, most agencies, it will be standard across the state. So if you're having a chat with us, we'll answer your questions. Um, we will then let you know which agencies are in your area. If you have a preference, you can go to one that you've already heard of or you're specifically wanting to work with, or you can be allocated to wherever is the greatest need. Um, agencies are based on our region and um, all of those agencies work to try to support children in that area. So which agents you go with, with won't impact which children you're able to care for. So essentially, we link you in with an agency. Within about two days, they'll give you a call. Um, they'll have a chat with you. We'll invite you to an information session once you've attended that, which is an opportunity to get to know their team, um, learn about their program, ask any other questions before you make the next dive in. And then once you're ready to go ahead, you can then register for training. Um, the training is mandatory across the state. There is no cost for you to complete this training. It's just your time. And the agency will let you know what they're, what type of way they're running it at the moment. Because following COVID, as you can imagine, there are a lot of hybrid styles and different ways that things are run now. Um, but the face-to-face -face is also returning as we are um, you know, in that COVID safe space. So um, the agency will be able to detail that for you a little bit more. Um, essentially covers eight modules and um, it covers the foundations of how children come into care, your role and responsibility as a foster carer, um, children's needs and practical skills on how to support the children that come into your care. Um, so it is very foundational. It covers um, a lot of information for you to have a really thorough understanding of the system, which can then better inform you as you go down that journey to identify what is going to be the best fit for me, what sort of foster care, I mean, foster care should I provide, um, what's going to fit my children if I have children in the home. Um, so, so just thinking about the more you know, the more um, informed of a decision you can make, and then the more uh, positive an experience it can be. And the agency will also be discussing what would be the best fit for you as well. Um, you can also withdraw from the assessment period at any time. So if you attend an information session and decide it's not for you or the training, you can take a step back, go on hold or, or just um, stop indefinitely as well. So there's no pressure to continue. And agencies want you to have a really um, clear idea of what's going to be the best thing for you. Um, so 
to not to go ahead if you don't feel ready. And you can have those discussions with them. Um, if you do feel ready at that stage, then a lot of agencies will have you fill out an application form. Um, this form will then include uh, police checks, reference checks, um, health checks, working with children's checks. So all of that paperwork is provided for you. You don't have to source it yourself. They, there's guidance on how to fill it out. And there's no cost involved to getting the um, checks run for you either. So the agency will cover the police checks. Um, and that is standard across the, the state to have those items filled out. Um, and then in addition to that, you start the assessment. Um, assessment sounds like a scary word. It really means that the agency is coming to meet with you one to one to talk about what it's really going to look like for you when you um, have a child come into your home, what's going to make it work well, um, what are the things you're going to need a little bit of help with, what does the agency need to know to support you, um, and so forth. So, so it is a really... Uh, thorough experience um, and it's very transparent so it's very collaborative you have a chat with the agency exactly of what you're looking for and that's where you identify your preferences or the children that you want to care for so you're not expected to have it completely figured out this early on of what sort of care you want to provide how many children you want to care for and what that's going to look like so you're not expected to be an expert in this and it is a learning journey so you build on everything as you go through that process, and then that helps you make an informed decision once you get to the end stage, with, along with what the agency is going to recommend for you. Um, and not to say once you get approved, um, you can also have that ebb and flow. So I worked with foster carers who you know, started off with doing respite, which is very common. A lot of agencies might have you start with doing respite to wrap your head around the placement, um, to have an understanding of um, the system and, and get to build connections with other foster carers before you start providing longer time types of care. Um, and, and then after that, carers might decide, actually, I want to do something more longer term. I want to do short term placements or I want to do a long term placement. Um, and this particular care I worked with after providing a um, placement for about two years that luckily ended in the child entering a um, reunifying with family for um, a beautiful outcome, they then decided to go back down to respite and emergency care because their working arrangements um, changed at the time. So it does really grow with you um, and that ebb and flow is possible. So you're never locked into one thing. Um, it can change with you and your lifestyle. So it's really important to know about the flexibility there. Um, with the, um, once you get approved or you're accredited, um, you also have a lot of support. So the agency will um, provide you support that's ongoing. You'll get ongoing training. You get to register with FCAV, which is the Foster Care Association of Victoria. And they are the peak body that supports foster cares with advocacy, counseling, um, additional training. Um, so there's a lot of different points where you can um, have additional networks of support that go beyond your own. Um, you do work really closely with the team. So you're never alone in that. Um, you are considered and professional in that sense. So you are, you know, the eyes and ears on the ground supporting the, um, the child that's living with you. And, and sometimes you're providing a lot of that information for the agency um, since you're, you're the expert in that space when, when the child's been living with you and you can tell what's been happening every single day. Um, going back really quickly to the assessment, um, it is really transparent. So you'll get to read everything and provide your feedback as well. Um, so, so it is a process that is done in unison um, as a team with the agency for what's going to be happening next. Um, placements last for a diverse um, diverse periods of time. So um, some carers care for children just for a night or for a weekend. Some carers do a couple of weeks. Some carers do long-term care until the age of 18. Um, so the different types of foster care, which I mentioned earlier, respite, um, is generally people who are new to fostering or someone who's got a very busy lifestyle or someone that has just identified that this is going to be what works best for them. Um, might do respite once a month. Um, they might do school holidays. Uh, it could be with the same child. Um, it could be just if you want that day scheduled out so the agency knows to contact you if there is a match for a placement so it doesn't necessarily have to be the same child every time. Um, then they can know to contact you and know that you're there to support someone if that um, need arises. 
Um, following that, you have emergency care. So emergency is a little bit of the opposite. It's less planned. So that could be you getting a call at 2 p.m. saying that, um, you know, five-year-old Sally has nowhere to stay tonight and what can you offer? Um, so every placement is always negotiated with you. Um, you never have to say yes to a placement. You can always say no. And it's about identifying what can you offer at this time, regardless of whether it's respite or emergency, et cetera. So um, with an emergency placement, they're usually um, just a couple of days. Um, or nights, or, or even one night in some case, and then that gives the agency and child protection an opportunity to find an alternative placement for that child. Um, Short-term placements, so those can last for a couple of weeks to a couple of months, um, and those are generally for children who have an active court matter, so it has not been identified whether they are returning to family um, or if there is any extended family that can care for them or whether there is a long-term placement available for them if that is the route that it's going towards. So short-term placements are a little bit in that space of um, exploring what happens next um, and, and what will be the best outcome for that child. Um, and then the final one uh, is long-term care. And long-term care is caring for a child until the age of 18, but remaining accredited with the foster care agency so that you continue having those wraparound supports. So I've thrown a lot of information at you guys. Do you have any questions or anything that you were specifically curious about? Um, before I start jumping into some of the myths that we see about foster care that come up quite a bit. Totally fine if not, but um, if you are curious about anything, don't be shy. If you want to have a chat later, you definitely can as well by giving us a call. All right, so um, some of the myths that are very common. So a lot of people, um, when I would be assessing them, they would have said that they'd been thinking about it for a long time, but they didn't know how flexible it was. So being aware of um, the different types of care, as I mentioned earlier, um, being aware that you can be working full time. You do not have to be a stay home foster carer to support a child because it is so flexible. So some children might need a full time carer at home, whilst others, um, you know, are school aged or are attending childcare um, and, and are able to have um, their carers working for them. So the agency will talk to you while you're going through that assessment about what's going to be the best fit for you. Um, so just considering if you're interested in younger children, um, you know, about whether there are child cares near you or um, if you wanted babies, is there capacity for someone to be at home? Uh, so those are things to think about. Um, you do not have to be in a relationship to care. So um, foster parents could be married, they could be de facto, they could be single, um, any sexuality, any gender. Uh, and we need carers from all varieties and backgrounds. Uh, so that is um, you know, very inclusive. And, and we, you know, we know that when you've had diverse experiences, you can then be um, a safe person for a child as well um, and be a great mentor for a child. So regardless of whether you're in your relationship or not, um, you can provide significant support. Um, and that can also include, you know, you don't have to have had parenting experience. Um, a lot of foster carers have not had children of their own or they're quite new to it. And that's where that training and that wraparound support comes in because it allows you to um, navigate the system and placements so that they're the best fit for you. Um, and then in the end, they end up being the best fit for the child when that matching is really, really clear. Um, you don't need to have your own home, um, and it doesn't need to, or own your own home, and you don't need to have a huge home. Um, so, you know, a, living in Metro Melbourne or wherever you are, um, you know, a child can feel safe regardless of which home they are living in. So um, it's just something to consider if you have a spare bedroom, um, would you be able to support a child? Uh, if you have multiple rooms, thinking... Um, you know what that would look like if you wanted to support siblings long term. Um, siblings can share a room together, but a foster care child cannot share a bedroom with another child. Um, it's also that's not related to them. Uh, so it has to be a room that they can access for themselves that can be their own space. Uh, so it's also recommended that if it's a share room that maybe you have um, shared custody of your own child and they swap in and out of that room, we, we generally wouldn't recommend that because we want it to be an independent space for that child to feel that it's something that they can make into their own um, safe haven, even if it's just for a few nights that they stay there instead of coming in and um, you know, taking over someone else's space. That's something to consider, but you can definitely be renting or you could own your home or and you could be in a share house. So it really, it really um, is open. Um, 
you another myth that comes up quite often is that you can't care if you have children in the home with you. Um, so a lot of foster carers do have their own children um, and they then consider what they think would be the best age of the children that they provide placement for. So some carers might choose to have older children in care with them. Um, some carers might um, choose to have placements that are younger than their own or similar ages. So as you go through that assessment, which is the final step of your recruitment process, um, you get to identify what would the logistics be that would be ideal for your house and the agency will have their recommendations as well. And I think we've got a um, question here. So with long-term care, is there a time frame as in a maximum period before either reunification or permanent care? Um, look, it, great question. Um, so that is very dependent on the circumstance. So long-term care as a foster care can go until the age of 18. So there definitely are some foster carers that remain working with the agency and to have that wraparound support as they go through adolescence. Um, maybe there's medical needs, maybe they just, um, you know, whatever the case is there to have that continued agency support. Um, reunification also very varied. It can really depend on what's happening in the court proceedings, what's the circumstance um, for that family, is their extended family available if they can't return to their birth family, um, so that can take time. Um, and then permanent care is also case by case, so depending on what is happening for that child and then their family. So what age are they at, what are their needs, um, and what would best suit them. So, so it really does vary. So there isn't a specific time frame, um, but providing long-term care can go until the age of 18. And when you have long-term care orders, um, those, those remain in place. So hopefully that answered your question. And if you have any more, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and with that note, fostering is different to permanent care and it's different to adoption. So as an adoptive parent, you become the permanent legal guardian or legal parent of that child or young person. Their birth certificate changes. Um, it's not for a fixed period of time. It's, it's ongoing um, beyond the age of 18. And, um, and it is a full legal change. Um, as a permanent uh, carer or permanent care, you become the legal guardian of that child. So then the department or child protection and the agency are no longer involved. Um, so some children that are in um, foster care and that have that long-term opportunity, some carers might consider becoming permanent carers or they might be asked to do that. But like I mentioned before, it is really case by case and there's no way pre to predict what that's gonna look like. And some carers actually prefer to stay long-term with the agency because of these circumstances for that child or for that family. Um, so it is something that you do discuss during the assessment once you're deciding what sort of care you're going to be providing. And then that is regularly reviewed. So every year your agency will review with you, you know, how was the year? Um, what could have gone better? What um, wasn't so great? What do you want to work on? What are your goals for next year? And, um, and that is an opportunity that's formal to flag, you know, I've been doing respite and emergencies and, um, and now I wanna do long-term, that's where they'll discuss that with you, or you don't have to wait for your annual review either. You can bring that up to the agency and then they will discuss what your accreditation looks like as well. Um, and my son came through to us through permanent care 17 years ago and we've started considering foster care now. Well, that's wonderful. Um, well, that's, that's, that's a really beautiful outcome and I really hope that, um, you know, if you guys do want to take the plunge, you can have a more, of a, more of a chat with us as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, another myth that goes into what we've kind of been chatting at is that um, you have to commit to having a child live with you for years at a time. So definitely with the flexible care arrangements, that's, um, that's not a uh, requirement there. Oh, and I think we've got another question. Are you able to foster care if you live in public housing? Yep, so the main qualifying point at this point in time is having a spare bedroom. So if you have a spare bedroom, you can then inquire with an agency. Um, if everyone in your household is on board with fostering, um, then you can explore that further. So being in public housing would not impact your application to care, um, but it's just about talking about your circumstance and how things look for you. And that's across, um, across the board for everything. Um, that's across the board for health conditions, um, for your mental well-being, mental health and well-being, um, for any disability needs. Um, you know, some people might have um, historic 
uh, criminal records and, and it really, um, those things wouldn't necessarily just dis disqualify you. It's just about discussing what that looks like, what it was, what were their circumstances around it and how it would impact you. Um, so hopefully that answered the question. I kind of went off on a tangent <laughs> there for you. So I do apologize for that. Um, and if you have any more questions, these are great, keep them coming. Um, a lot of people are curious about the information that you get about a child before they come into placement and what you're going to know. So every agency receives a referral from child protection of children needing placement. So some places get multiple referrals a day, sometimes there's 20 referrals a day, and then it's, you know, the office looking at what carers are available, what can they provide, and what's the best match for them, dependent on what information we have available. So you receive that referral as a foster carer and you keep that confidentially. Um, it gives you information about the child's name, their date of birth, where they came from, what brought them into care, where they go to school, do they have any health needs, um, you know, what language do they speak, and then any notes that are also available of how they've tracked while they've gone through um, previous placements before. So did, did a previous foster care note their routine or their favorite food or what we know about them? Um, so you get to receive all of that uh, before you make the decision of accepting the placement. Um, sometimes children are removed quite quickly. And in that case, they might not have been known to child protection. Um, maybe information is still being gathered um, on that family. So that referral might be a little bit more bare. And, um, and in that case, you might be kind of the eyes and ears for the agency gathering, you know, some of those details about the child's routine, um, you know, how that's looking, you know, what, what things do they really like to do and enjoy. So um, sometimes there isn't a lot of information there and the agency will always flag that with you. And you're always able to ask more questions as well. Um, so if an agency approaches you, um, you can then you know, say, actually, I'm really curious about this, or, um, you know, sometimes babies coming into care, what formula are they on? What sort of nappies do we need? Um, or a child coming in being like, can you find out what their favorite food is? Because I really want them to feel comfortable tonight when they when they come and stay at ours to let them know that they're welcome. Um, so you can always ask more questions. I think we've got another question here. Um, so how does it work financially to support the child? So as a foster care, you are a volunteer. Um, but you receive a care allowance that supplements providing that day-to-day -day care for the child. So that goes towards them being in your home, um, towards expenses like clothing and food, um, extracurricular activities. Um, any additional significant expenses um, do get negotiated with the agency and the department. So um, if you're requiring child care, that's something you can have a discussion with. You can have a chat about that during the assessment and also before accepting placements to identify what that will look like. Um, same thing with medical expenses so there's definitely room for further support um, but as a carer you do get care allowance um, and I believe my wonderful colleague just shared the DFFH care allowances page so that is dependent on a child's age and their level of need and those rates are available online so that has just been added into the chat for you to have a look at um, from memory I do believe the care allowance starts from about uh, 400 a fortnight um, and then you'll be able to see the rates that go on from there. Um, so hopefully that has answered your question. Um, in terms of choosing the age and number of children that you care for, so you definitely get to do that during the assessment. Um, so the assessment will identify and your accreditation will then identify how many children you can care for, the type of children you will care for, their ages, and then within that you also have a preference. So someone might be accredited to care for uh, 0 to 12, but your preference might actually be um, 2 to 10, um, and that can, you know, the agency will then approach you within your preference, um, and then if you ever needed to care for a child um, beyond your preference, but within that accreditation, there would be capacity for that um, as well, so that's dependent on, you know, what the agency felt you'd be, um, have capacity for and, and what your strengths were. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are a recruitment agency, so there's a question about whether we're based in Australia. Yes, we are based in Melbourne, Victoria. Um, we work for the whole state of Victoria. We're not a foster care agency ourselves, but we work with all the agencies in the state. Um, so we have about 23, I think, agencies at the top of my head that are signed up with us. And if you inquire through us, you can choose via our website which one you get allocated to. 
um, to go ahead with them and then they'll have that call and have a chat with you about moving forward, um, invite you to the information sessions and the training and um, and then continue on. I do realize I have an accent. I am an American, but I have been in Australia for um, nearly 10 years. So we're definitely based in Australia, but it is the Victorian system. So we don't um, work interstate. Um, if you are curious about um, services interstate, there are similar um, supports available that can provide you information. Um, in New South Wales, it's My Forever Family. Um, I think in Queensland, it's uh, Queensland Kinship and Foster Care, I think something like that. If you Google that, that should come up. Um, but yeah, no, so definitely, definitely Victoria, Australia based. Um, and on that note, so a lot of people asked, um, come to us if they are particularly on a sponsorship visa or maybe they're a permanent resident. So permanent residents, um, citizens from New Zealand and Australian um, citizens um, can provide all types of care um, that they're accredited for. Um, if you are a non-permanent resident and you are perhaps on a sponsored business visa or um, you know, in that interim period, then you would be able to provide respite emergency short term, but not long term care until the visa would um, be something more permanent, like a permanent resident arrangement. Just because, as you can imagine, um, especially with like business visas, if that's tied to your employment and then something happens and you have to leave the country and you had a child that was expecting to be with you for a prolonged period of time, that would be quite a uh, you know a very unfortunate outcome. So. Um, that is definitely considered um, in that space as well. Um, children in care also have contact with their family. So you will be supporting a child to have um, their court ordered family contact. Um, and that will generally be supervised by child protection or by the agency, but you will be providing that emotional support beforehand and afterwards um, and ensuring that the contact can be as positive as it can be. We know that children that have um, that grow up to have a really strong sense of identity um, are supported in understanding their circumstance as to why they are in care, and they are supported in having a, a positive relationship with their family. Um, children in care, you know, regardless of what has happened to them, love their parents very much and um, benefit when they have a positive relationship with them. So, as a carer, um, you are a part of that journey for them and and help and. Um, develop that identity um, but all of that is covered in you know the training and, and as you're working with the agency so any questions that you have um, you're never alone in that and we've got another question here if i don't have a driver's license or a car can i still be a foster care i use public transport and taxis easily yeah so having a driver's license or having your own car is not a requirement um, so that would not disqualify you from being a carer um, so essentially, it's just about looking at how you would support children. Um, how are you going to help them get to an appointment? What's the plan? If it was an emergency, um, are you prepared to get um, get that taxi or or whatever you need to, to get to a hospital? How are you going to help them attend appointments, getting to and from school, um, if, if that's what you're doing? So um, definitely, you don't have to have a driver's license or a car. But then when you get to that assessment stage, it's looking at what is this going to practically look like um, to make sure that, that you're comfortable with all of that, which it sounds like you are, so that's great. Um, any other questions? Um, on that note, with like supporting children to attend school and things like that, ideally when children come into care, we want to keep them at their local school. So as you can imagine, if you have, um, you know, unfortunately weren't safe at home and you had to enter foster care as a last resort, um, you're moving around, you're in a new environment, you're living with people that you haven't heard of. And despite these people being really excited and, and wanting to do a beautiful thing, they're still strangers to this child. So um, we want children to have those attachments that they feel safe with as, as much as they can. And school is a huge part of a child's life. Um, so uh, being able to support a child stay in their school is preferred. Um, and that will be a consideration of when a placement, you know, when you are approached to support a placement. So um, that can look like, uh, what, depending on where you live, that can potentially look like what can you do to support them to attend that school, um, or whether there need to be transport or contact, um, transport arrangements to get them to and from school. 
Um, in some cases, when a child is then in a long-term placement, um, schools can be explored to be changed, but ideally we do like children to remain where they were to help that attachment and that permanency, especially when their placement is not um, confirmed about what the future of that's going to be. So that's definitely um, something that comes up a lot. Um, can you apply to be a foster care if you have been in foster care? Absolutely. Um, so that is a very common one. And as I mentioned before, we look for carers from all walks of life. Um, having a care experience yourself um, can provide a, um, a lot of empathy and support for a child. And just with like the other things I mentioned before, it's about considering, you know, what, how will that impact your own well-being and yourself? And um, how will that impact your ability to provide care? Um, so just with like any... Um, any life events or any health circumstances, um, all of those things get explored um, in the assessment. So how do you manage this um, is explored in the assessment. What are your support networks like now? Um, how do you work within a team? So um, all of those things are explored for everyone that applies. Um, and, you know, we, we always talk about how it takes a village to support children. So foster cares are a part of that, but you're working along with the team. So you're never alone in that space. Um, so great question. Thank you. Um, what else comes up quite a bit? Um, so people in your household who are over 18 do need to attend the training with you. Um, some people who have an extended support network or if they have children um, who might be teenagers, they might get them involved in attending training as well. Um, the training is really fantastic. Sorry about my speaking chair. The training is really fantastic. It, um, it gives you so much information. And often when it's inappropriate for biological children to attend, um, generally if they're, if they're adolescents or teenagers, then um, they find that a lot of information out of it and it's really insightful for them as well. And it supports with that understanding of um, what it's going to be like to have a foster care child in the home and, you know, how their role will impact that and the relationships that they can have. So, so it is really um, great to have um, them participate in that as well. But yeah, over 18 and in, in living in the home, they will have to attend. Um, some people have their support network attend so that they can be across it. So um, I've had uh, people come to training that were um, family members that didn't reside in the home but would be providing that supportive role or um, you know someone's best friend came with them as a support person so they could be across it because they nominated them um, that they will be a part of that journey with them um, so you know the more information the better it's really good to have an informed decision there and to have your support network across that if that's an option um, and if you have children in the home will they be included in the recruitment process that question comes up quite a bit um, so they will. Um, so part of the, the assessment process when they're meeting with you one to one to discuss what it's going to look like is that there will be a home and environment check. And there also is a visit with the other household members, um, regardless if they're um, housemates or if they're bi uh, a biological child in the home. Um, they will then also get to meet with the agency worker to discuss their views on fostering, how they think it's going to impact them, how they would seek support in that. So, um, so it's definitely a very um, holistic and very inclusive process of everyone in the home to make sure everyone's on the same page and um, they know how they would manage different things and who they would talk to as they take on that journey. So, um, so that's something that comes up quite a bit. Um, what else? Traveling interstate. That is often a question that comes up a bit. Traveling overseas when we're allowed to. <laughs> At the moment, we cannot. Um, so yes, you can definitely travel. And it's just then um, exploring uh, when it's going to happen, um, getting a permission to travel form, which you get from the department. So the agency does that for you. So planning in advance is great. Um, and then just being considerate of, you know, what is happening for that child at the time. So are the court proceedings very um, active at the moment and they wouldn't be able to travel or, or what that looks like. So the agency will definitely step that out with you. Um, and so we have gone through quite a bit of information. I'm conscious that I've been overloading you guys a little bit. Are there any final questions before we start to wrap up for today? And no pressure if you don't have any questions right now. Like I mentioned before, you can have a read through our website. So that's fosteringconnections.com.au. I believe it's been linked in the chat quite a bit. Then you've got the phone number behind us. So you can give us a call um, any day and we'll get back to you between Monday and Friday to have um, specific chats about your own circumstance or something that you might be worried about. 
Um, and we will be doing more of these in the future, so keep an eye out for future scheduled events um, of Foster Care Lives. Um, if you come to Midsummer Pride Parade, we'll see you there on Sunday. Um, we'll have our Fostering Connections t-shirts on and a bunch of banners and flags, so we're happy to say hello um, in a socially distanced, um, safe way. But um, yeah. So look, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. We've had some wonderful questions today. Um, and if you want any more information, feel free to get in touch. So thank you.